Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Good afternoon by five minutes. Ah, Jerry gets me every time. All right. We are glad to have you here with us. Uh, we're glad to have the air conditioning working here, but not in my Sabbath school room this morning. That's okay. We're going to work on that. Um, hope that you have had a great week, but whatever the week has brought you, that it leads you to a place where we can just together turn our attention away from the things maybe that have weighed us down, away from the things that we've maybe brought or carried into this room. We can let those things go and we can turn our attention to the glory and the majesty and the beauty of God. Um, and I'm enjoying this series on the book of Romans. I hope you are as well. I hope you can spend some extra time and study as we go through this important, crucial book. Um, and today for a call to worship for us, uh, just a thought from the psalmist, Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. So let us worship and praise this God this morning. I invite you to pray with me. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for calling us to this place. I thank you for turning our attention away from the things uh, of our week, the busyness and the craziness, and I pray that you would help us to lift our eyes to you, the author and perfect of our faith, who for the glory and the joy set before you endured the cross, scorning its shame, and the joy that was set before you was each one of us. So we thank you for that, and we ask that you would teach us this morning how to worship, teach us this morning how to let go of all the things that we hold on to and embrace Jesus with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul. We love you and we look forward to catching a glimpse of you here in this place together as a community of faith. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. So this morning as we continue to worship, we invite you just to take a moment to greet those around you, welcome them, wish them a happy Sabbath as we continue to worship together this morning. Welcome everybody to Kettering Life. Thank you so much, everyone who is a part of the Kettering Church Faith community. Uh, we have a lot going on and it's really good to be connected in community. So I have three quick announcements, but here's the great thing, it's summer finally. Yes, no more snow and ice and it's fantastic. So with the beginning of summer, of course here at church, we have a summer schedule and kind of a summer culture that we are beginning that we want you to know about. First, this Sabbath, June 2 is the last concert of the season for Praise Orchestra here at Kettering Church and it is called Saxational featuring Shannon Young. It starts this Sabbath, June 2 at 8 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Second, this summer is the second summer where we at the Kettering Church have a day camp. Day camp starts this Monday, June 4, starting at 7.30. It's available from 7.30 to 4 for students ages 6 to 12. If you want more information about this, check out the online website or go and talk to Pastor Alex. But day camp does start this next Monday, June 4, from 7.30 to 4 for ages 6 to 12. And finally, that's it. Next Wednesday, June 6th, is the beginning of Wacky Wednesday. We've been doing this now for a couple of years, and uh, Wacky Wednesday starts at 4, ends at 8. Great time to come together with your friends, your family, your neighbors, and eat and hang out and have a good time. Uh, just enjoy each other. But that is here at the church from 4 to 8, starting, and it's every Wednesday throughout the summer, but it starts this next Wednesday, June 6th. My name is Jason Calvert, and this is Kettering Life. This morning, I get to share some really fun information for you. Yesterday, we had 20 pre-registered children for our day camp, 
And last year at this time, we had two. So we are up in numbers and we're delighted. The most wonderful piece of information about the 20 that are pre-registered is that 47% are non-Adventists. And then the other wonderful piece is that yesterday we got word that we have on top of the 20 that are pre-registered, 30 Rwandan students that are going to be coming. And I asked for Michelle to talk to us a little bit about the Rwandan students that she has gotten to know this year at Spring Valley Academy. As we've shared with you, the Rwandan students that have come here as refugees, their families have come here, they don't know the language, they don't know the culture, and Spring Valley Academy, alongside many of the area churches, including ours, have sponsored these children to get an education, a Christian education, but this summer, we're sponsoring them to be at day camp. Tell me a little bit, Michelle, about your experience working with these students this year. Okay, I would love to, because I love talking about these kids. So I ran the tutoring center at Spring Valley this last school year, and um, the way that they touch your heart is beyond any blessing that you could ex expect. Um, I have a card that one of the um, freshmen wrote to me at the end of the school year, and I told Pastor Alex, I'm going to try to hold it together because it just warms your heart. But two things that she said is, um, thank you for your time. You've been a loving and caring mother for us. And also taking us like your kids, we also take you like a second mother because of everything you've done for us. And then she goes on to say, I really appreciate you, you, I really appreciate you. Nothing that I can give you to pay you back for everything. All I can say is God give you more blessing with your family. And I think we were talking before the service and I, I think that just those words pay me back for everything. And I didn't need to be paid back, but it's the blessing. It's the blessing that we get when we answer God's calling and, um, you know, to be able to help out with the day camp and to give your time or to give your offering over the summer. Um, I know that you would get the same blessing and um, be paid back a, a hundredfold for, for answering God's call to serve. Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. The truth is, and you did great, you held it together reading the card. Yeah. Um, what we don't know is what this will do when we invest in the children of our community and the children that we've been entrusted with. We just don't know what, um, what the return on that investment will be. And we, we pray that that investment will lead them to Jesus and will lead them to heaven. And so we do continue to ask. We have most of our funding. We are still needing um, a, a couple more to be sponsored because initially we were hoping for 26, but we found out yesterday it's 30 that are coming. And so we do need some more help financially if you can give that way. If not, if you say, you know what, I want to come and help. Um, we have a, a lovely lady from our church that's going to be preparing the lunches every day for them because they can't even provide their own lunches and so we will be providing those that's what some of the funding is going for so if you want to come and help every morning to just to, uh, even if it's half an hour or an hour to to help with lunches or even if you have an hour every day to come and help with the tutoring that would be wonderful you can reach me you can contact me and I know that God will bless the lives of these children but as you have been a testimony, God blesses you because you've been willing to bless. And that is my prayer for you, church family. We invite you to serve our Rwandan students. Yeah. Yeah, just one more thing I wanted to share about how important this is for these kids because we all know um, over the summer, you know, there's always a lapse and, and kids, you know, get, get relaxed in their schedule and there's not a lot of academics. Um, but as these students were leaving last Friday on the last day of school, I was getting them on the bus that takes them home and, I, you know, I would make sure I was on the bus and they were leaving behind me. They were getting off the bus and going back down the car line crying and wanting to say goodbye to everybody and saying goodbye to their teachers and saying goodbye to Mrs. Coy, who's moving. And they just, they just didn't want to go home. They didn't want to stop being a part of that community and their friends and the teachers. So for them to be able to come here, and I don't know how much they know, if they're, what they're going to get to do here is going to be just amazing. I would love to see their reactions of the fact that they're going to get to do it all summer. Yes. Thank you so much, yes. Michelle, Thank and you. may God bless you. At this time, we invite all the children that can to come and collect the children's offering. Help me out, kids, collect any of those dollar bills that are being flagged, and if you'll make your way to the front, and we have a story for you.
Good morning. This morning, I want to tell you a story about a little girl named Alex. And she found this stuff. Do you want to touch it? She found this stuff in her bathroom. Her mommy and daddy were remodeling the bathroom. And she found this and she said, Ooh, that feels so cool and so weird. And I want to play with it. And she touched it, and then she thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go find mommy's sewing kit, and I'm going to find every single piece of a needle that I can find or straight pins, and I'm going to put it, yeah, I'm going to put it in that, in my mom's, in this bathroom, in this stuff. And so she went and she grabbed all of this stuff the needles and she put it in the white, weird, foamy, silly putty type stuff. And she thought, oh, this is so cool. And then suddenly she heard her mom and she thought, oh no, mom's gonna know. She thought about it. There was no rule that said she couldn't put needles in the white, weird stuff in the bathroom. And she never, but for some reason she felt nervous and she felt scared. And so she immediately put all those pins away. And she put the pins away and she knew that she had to hide what she had done. Well, she put everything away as fast as she could. Do you want more? She put everything away as fast as she could. There were those needles. She put them all away, and she went on about her business, didn't say anything to anybody, and there she was, completely forgetting about the white, weird stuff in the newly remodeled bathroom. When all of a sudden that evening, she heard her father, and he said, oh, who did this? She knew. She knew she got this, this really bad feeling in the pit of her stomach. Daddy said, called everybody to the bathroom. Everybody come here. Everybody went and he said, there's holes in the brand new caulking of the bathroom. There's holes everywhere. Who did this? And she saw that daddy was so upset and she saw that he was so mad. He goes, I can't believe all the holes. Who in the world would have put all these holes? This is terrible. We're going to have to redo this whole thing. Oh, no. She wasn't going to tell at all that she had done it. She was too scared. She was too afraid. She was like, must have been sister. Must have been older sister. And older sister's like, I didn't do it. It must have been baby sister. She couldn't talk. <laughs> she probably didn't do it. So <laughs> daddy said, well, I know one of you have done this. And the one of you that has done this had better tell and better tell us who did it. Alex was keeping her mouth shut. Mm -mm -mm. Not going to tell. Mm -mm -mm. Daddy's so mad. Daddy's so upset. Daddy said, I want you to go to your rooms and think about this. And then when you come back out, I want somebody to tell me who did this. Well, she went into her room and her sister went into her room and the baby went into her room and everybody was quiet. And she thought and she thought and she said, no way, I'm not telling, I'm not telling. When all of a sudden there was a knock on her door and it was her dad and he said, Alex, I need to talk with you. Oh no. How does he know? He knows. He said, Alex, did you do it? And she didn't want to tell. She didn't want to tell. She's like, no, 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 no. And daddy said, well, there has to be a punishment because someone did this that was wrong. And there has to be punishment. So we are going to have this punishment and he talked with her, and he, he and she talked for a while, and the punishment was clear. Later that night, she was in her bed, and mommy came to say goodnight and to kiss. Mommy came to say goodnight and to kiss her, and Alex said, Mommy, it was me. It was me. I'm the one that did it. 
And mommy says, I think daddy knows. But you need to go tell daddy yourself. Oh. She said, daddy's in the den. Go find daddy. So she went crawling into the den, walking to the den, and she saw that the door was cracked open. And she looks in to tell daddy. And guess what she found? Her daddy was there on the floor kneeling and praying and crying. He said, dear father, please forgive Alex. Please forgive her. She didn't know that she was doing something wrong. Please forgive her. Teach her to tell the truth. Teach her to own up to her mistakes. Please, Father, help her. Alex stood there and realized how much her daddy loved her, but also that her daddy had perfect judgment. And he was, he could know, he knew that she had done something wrong. That night, she learned about her father's love, but she learned about God's love, too. And every time you go in the bathroom and you see some of this white, weird, funny-looking stuff, remember that our Heavenly Father has perfect judgment. He loves us. Do you want more? He loves us so much that he sent Jesus to save us and help us from our mistakes. So every time you see that, remember our Heavenly Father loves us. And remember, don't put any pins in it. You've been good listeners. You can go back to your seats now. Well, church, we are indeed blessed. Amen. God is good. He sends passionate leaders into our lives to make our church and our community and the ministries of our church so much better. And so it's a privilege for me to bring up uh, Michael Bodie. In case some of you are thinking, hmm, Michael Bodie, I've heard that name before. How do I know that name? He's grown up in this community, he graduated from Spring Valley Academy, and 10 months ago he joined our, our staff here uh, as an intern for, for youth ministries and 413 and Paracresis Ministries. He has done so much behind the work, uh, behind the scenes work, uh, and specifically when he came and he interviewed, if you remember, we said, well, why, you know, he graduated from Oakwood with theology, and like, well, why did you study that? And he said, I just want to serve God and the church and his people, and he has done that these last 10 months. So can we just give him a round of applause for appreciation for all that Michael has done for our church, for our kids, the, the, all the stuff. He has done a lot of planning behind uh, the scenes for that. So I'm just very thankful for him, and I just want to pray a blessing upon him as he transitions uh, from, this, uh, from this role. Yes, thank you. A blessing to work with you. Also, I want to thank Kettering Praise Orchestra. I have often said uh, Kettering Praise Orchestra does a high Sabbath make. Just your presence here makes it a destination church service. Like, it's worth getting on an airplane and flying across the country just to hear your music. I am always so blessed, and I absolutely love it when you are here. Uh, and I'm sad that your season is now over. Uh, I do want to say a special thank you to uh, the director, the conductor, uh, Don Huff, who over the past year has been incredibly busy. He has served as our interim director of music and the arts, and uh, Don, I don't know where you are. Right here. <laughs> yeah, right in front oh, of Oh, right here. Hi. <laughs> there you go, Don. Yeah. You are... Don, you are such 
an incredible person. You are such a blessing to work with, uh, and your standard of excellence is out of the stratosphere. Uh, and Don has been not only serving as our Minister of Music, but also as a uh, band director at Spring Valley Academy, and again, as a father of somebody in your band. I am so, so grateful for your leadership. And then also, of course, you have been serving as the conductor of this amazing group of musicians behind me. And Don, we are just so thankful. And we do want to present you with a small gift of our, to uh, small token of our appreciation uh, tonight at the concert. And friends, you do not want to miss the concert tonight at 8 o'clock right here in the sanctuary is going to be an amazing conclusion to an incredible season with the praise orchestras. But Don, uh, we, we want to offer a blessing for both of you, and uh, we just rejoice together uh, for all that you have meant to this congregation over the past year, so thank you. Uh, God, for Michael and, and Don, we are just so grateful. We are celebrating how you have worked uh, through them uh, to minister in this place. And, and we see their fingerprints all over the place of uh, the difference that they have made in our young people, in, uh, in all of us, God, as they have uh, faithfully served you. Uh, we rejoice and we say thank you, God, for entrusting their ministry in this place to us over the past year. Uh, continue to bless them in the next uh, chapter of their lives. Uh, continue to anoint them by your Spirit is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Michael.
We pay our bills. We buy things we need and want. We spend money, but we give to those we love. If we make God first in our thoughts, talk, and our giving, it should be the most natural thing for us to give to our Lord. You can give and not love, but if you love, you will give. Dear Lord, thank you for what you have given us and bless this offering. Amen.
another. You are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now we know that God is judgment against those who do such things based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kingdom is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will pay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give them eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. At this time, I'd like to invite all who are willing and able to please kneel. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you've given us and for waking us up and giving us another day of life where we can live and worship you. Lord, we want to thank you for bringing us all safely here to church. Thank you for all the students who are home with their families and all who are going home. Please bless them this summer. Lord, we also want to thank you for our day camp that is coming up and for the ministry opportunity that we have there. Please help the staff to lead the children to you in a way that no one else can. We also want to thank you for all the Rwandan students who are coming, and we pray that you will give the sponsorships for the ones who still need it. Lord, we want to pray for everyone traveling this summer. Please be with all of those going to visit family and friends, and please bless them. Lord, we also want to pray for all those who are sick or in need of healing. We think of Carrie Beck, Pastor Hafner's sister-in-law who is battling with cancer. We think of Zelda Dunn who needs healing and recovery. Think of Teresa Simmons who needs full recovery, Lord. We just pray that you put your healing hand on all the sick and suffering. And please bless all of those who have lost loved ones recently. Lord. Please be with us now as we hear this message. We pray that you open our ears so we get what you want us to hear. And please help us to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In your name I pray, amen. I used to live between two Steves. One Steve lived in the apartments across from the park. The other Steve lived up my block, but I never really knew him. Steve from the apartments, he was such a friendly guy, always smiling, always laughing, always happy. He was also usually drunk, even at school. But it, it could have been worse. He could have been the other Steve. Steve from up the block was quiet, he never seemed happy, was never smiling. He didn't like the other Steve. One time, <laughs> when Steve from the apartment was so drunk he couldn't even stand up, the other Steve just shook his head and frowned. He did not like him, and he didn't think he was funny either. Steve from the apartments wasn't a great student. I saw his report card once. If I had come home with grades like that, my parents would have killed me. Steve from up the block was an honor student, I think. He never really talked to me or the other Steve. If I have to say one good thing about Steve from up the block is, well, he knew how to dress. He always looked nice, he was always clean, and really kind of handsome. The other Steve would have been as well if he had shaved, cut his hair, and worn something other than his dad's old Led Zeppelin t-shirts. He, still, he was a good kid. He always talked to me, and 
He always remembered my birthday, even if he forgot to get me a gift. He wanted to be my friend, and I was glad to have him. Okay, things got worse at home. They had never been great between me and my mom, but that day, I couldn't take it anymore. I was done. When I got to the bus station, I was sobbing. I poured my heart out to the two Steves. I told them why I was upset. I told them I didn't know what to do. I told them I needed the pain to go away. Steve from up the block finally spoke to me. He said he knew someone who loved me. He said his friend could give me peace and all I had to do was admit that I was a sinner. And then I'd go to heaven just like him. Steve from the apartment, he didn't tell me about anyone who could fix me. He told me he loved me, he hugged me. He told me I should get high, because that's what he always does. He said he's going to hell anyways, what difference did it make? When the other Steve heard this, he was furious. He called the other Steve a fool, and he said if I did the same thing, then I was a fool too. I didn't need any more name calling that day. What I needed was a friend. And that's why I did what I did. And all right, I know, it was stupid. I used to ride the bus between two Steves. One Steve was my friend the day we met. The other Steve never said a word to me until the day he told me what a fool I was. Looking back at it now, I realize it was a huge mistake, but if you were in my place, what would you have done? Thanks, Justin. Last Sabbath, I am told that the young adult Sabbath school class had quite the spirited conversation. Uh, now, they're just studying the same things we're looking at in our pulpit series. So last week, of course, they discussed the wrath of God, a very difficult topic. Uh, apparently, even an hour after the Sabbath school class was over, there were young adults still discussing this topic. And it doesn't get any easier this week. We move from the wrath of God to now today, Paul talks about the judgment of God. We're working our way through the book of Romans uh, in different mini-series. And today we begin a new mini-series simply called The Judged. Now, the whole idea of judgment, th this is really uh, Paul's most thorough treatment of the topic in Romans chapter 2, but it was an idea that really came out of Judaism. Greek and Roman philosophers didn't really speak much or teach much on the topic of a final day of judgment. Now, it's important to understand that this uh, whole idea of judgment must be seen in the broader context of Paul's theology. And so as we're working our way through the book of Romans, you understand, of course, Romans talks all about righteousness by faith in Christ alone. And so in that context, the judgment becomes good news. In the words of N.T. Wright, the word judgment carries negative overtones for a good many people in this liberal and post-liberal world. We need to remind ourselves that throughout the Bible, God's coming judgment is a good thing. It's something to be celebrated, longed for, yearned for. It causes people to shout for joy in the trees of the field, to clap their hands in a world of systematic injustice, bullying, violence, arrogance, and oppression. The thought that there might come a day when the wicked are finally put in their place, and the poor, and the weak, and the abused are given their due is the best news there can be. 
faced with a world in rebellion, a world of exploitation and wickedness. A good God must be a God of judgment. This past week, I read a book. I couldn't put it down. Uh, it was very disturbing on one level, titled Killers of the Flower Moon, written by David Gran. It tells the true story of the Osage Indians back in Oklahoma in 1920s. And as I found myself reading this story, I became more and more outraged. At one point, I just felt like my blood was boiling to the point that I had to vent, and so I called my brother and just said, I'm so angry because it's the story of how the Osage Indians could not get a fair trial, and they were systematically being murdered by poisoning, by gunshots, by explosions. And everybody seemed to be in on the corruption. The judges, the governor of the state, the private detectives who were working on it, everybody. And I found myself outraged. How can this be? It's the story of when there is no justice. Nobody wants that. N.T. Wright is correct when he says a good God must be, must be a God of judgment. So Paul begins in Romans chapter 2 to discuss the judgment of God. The first four verses, he juxtaposes our imperfect judgment toward one another with the perfect judgment of God. If you have the outline there in your bulletin, or if you have your Bible, turn to Romans 2. We begin in verse 1, where Paul says, You therefore have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. That's the problem with our human judgment, is that we're just as guilty. We do the same things. And so what we tend to do is then judge people on certain lifestyle choices or behaviors that we subscribe to, and then we think everybody else should follow suit. An example of this woman by the name of Johanna Reardon tells about how when their kids were quite young, they decided that they would not let their children watch R-rated movies. But because they weren't going to watch R-rated movies, she and her husband decided that they would join their children, that they would not watch any R-rated movies either. And she writes, we made this decision in good conscience, never regretted it, I found, however, that it made me feel judgmental toward other parents who watch R-rated movies. Can you relate to that? I certainly can. She said, I began to feel they weren't fully committed to Christ because they watched things that I decided not to watch. Now, maybe it's because I have grown up fourth generation, Seventh-day Adventists, that I can really relate to this. I can be very judgmental on things that I have decided to do for myself, then I think everybody else, if they're spiritual like I am, well, then they should follow suit, right? Now, it may not be R-rated movies, maybe a vegan diet. You find yourself looking down on anybody who would eat cheese. Maybe it's wearing jewelry or swimming on the Sabbath, drinking alcohol, going to a restaurant after church, whatever it might be. It's easy, isn't it? To have sort of a judgmental spirit toward people who make different lifestyle choices than you might. And Paul says to us, oh, be careful on that one. Because you're doing the same things that they are. Only God exercises 
perfect judgment. He goes on, verse 2, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. No argument with Paul here. Everybody knows God's judgment is perfect. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, he repeats this phrase, you do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? How do you figure you're going to escape God's judgment when you sit in judgment with others and yet you do the same things? I think of the news story, maybe you remember it, out of Broward County Courthouse down in Florida. Over the course of just six months, three judges were all busted for drunk driving. All of the judges, of course, sat behind the bench and they ruled on DUI cases. Of course, you can imagine the public was outraged, demanding that all three of the judges resign, which they did, because as the public wanted to know, how can they sit in judgment if they do the same things? Well, that's the very question Paul asks. And he follows up with an equally uncomfortable question. He says, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Now, this is not a hypothetical question. Keep in mind that Paul is writing primarily to a Jewish audience. Many of the readers of this letter to the churches in Rome, many of them would in fact believe that they were exempt from God's judgment, that they would escape God's judgment simply because they were born Jewish. In Kent Hughes' commentary on Romans, he writes, the Jews believe that everyone else would be judged except the Jewish race. A common tradition claimed that Abraham himself sat at the gate of hell to keep all Jews out regardless of their deeds. Doesn't really matter what they did, regardless of their deeds, many Jews believe that Abraham was stationed at the gate of hell to keep all the Jews from having to go to hell. And Paul's going to address this issue of deeds and what we actually do here in a moment. Trypho the Jew said, they who are of the seed of Abraham, according to the flesh, shall in any case, even if they be sinners and unbelieving and disobedient, doesn't matter what their deeds are, even if they're disobedient, unbelieving, sinners, doesn't matter. Trypho said, if they are born of the seed of Abraham, if they are Jewish, then they absolutely will share in the eternal kingdom. So when Paul asks, what well, do you think by being Jewish you're going to escape God's judgment? In fact, many of the people did believe as much. He then writes, verse 4, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? See, if you think that you are beyond God's judgment, you show contempt for his grace. Now, in the first four verses, Paul juxtaposes the perfect judgment of God with our imperfect judgment toward one another. Now, in the next six verses here, Paul contrasts those who live according to the way of Jesus with those who do not. And he talks about the natural consequences of those who rebel against God. So look at verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when His righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. God will repay on the day of judgment each person according to what they have done. Now, this doesn't really sound much like Paul, does it? 
Sounds like James. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. What you do is what is so important. Now, you think about the writings of Paul. It's all about we are saved. Apart from our works, we are saved by the gift of Christ Jesus, period. And yet here, he says on the day of judgment, you will be paid for what you have done. And it's interesting because Martin Luther, the great reformer, he loved the Apostle Paul. He couldn't get enough of the gospel, the just shall live by faith alone. He despised James. In fact, he ripped the book of James out of his Bible and stated, James does so much violence to Scripture and so contradicts Paul and all of Scripture, I refuse him a place among the writers of the true canon of my Bible. Why did he not like James? Well, because James says, don't talk about your faith. Show me your faith by what you do. He loved Paul, ironically, who says on the day of judgment, you will be judged by what you do. Just a couple of weeks ago, I spoke at a weekend retreat for singles. They said the key verse that we would like you to preach out of for the entire weekend is Ephesians 2.10. I couldn't remember what Ephesians 2.10 was, so of course I had to look it up to see what sermons I was going to preach. And I was quite surprised by the text. Partly because they would choose that as the key text to focus on all weekend, but partly because it was written by the Apostle Paul. This trumpet for righteousness by faith. Ephesians 2.10 simply says, we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's the verse. We were created to do good works. Apparently, there's not a real contradiction between the writings of James and Paul. Scripture is not against good works. Scripture does not speak against effort. In fact, Jesus himself makes the statement, make every effort. Bible's not against effort. The Bible speaks against trying to earn your salvation. And this is, of course, what Paul will write about as we continue in our study through the book of Romans. That we don't earn our salvation through our good works, but we do show our status as saved through what we do. And then verse 7, he goes on to say, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Twice he repeats that phrase, first for the Jew, also for the Gentile. In other words, everybody is going to have to face that day of judgment. And notice in the passage we just read that here Paul contrasts those who choose to follow in the way of Christ, and then he juxtaposes them with those who choose to reject the teachings and the way of Jesus. And notice the kinds of words he used to describe first those who choose eternal life in Christ, glory, honor, immortality, peace, just our choices have consequences. And it's just a wise way to live. Peace, immortality, honor. 
Now, compare that to the words he uses to describe those who rebel against God. Wrath, anger, trouble, distress, and so on. So, you choose. But the real point that Paul is making in this section of Romans comes to us then in verse 11, where he just states bluntly, God does not show favoritism. Jew, Gentile, Adventist, atheist, doesn't matter. You cannot escape the judgment of God. That's the real point of this passage. All of us someday will face God's judgment. Old story, New Year's Day. My wife and I had been up late the night before welcoming in the new year when about three o'clock in the morning we heard this loud banging noise downstairs like you know, somebody was trying to break into our home. And so my wife uh, was all concerned. She says, what's that loud noise downstairs? I said, what loud noise, dear? Uh, of course, I had to say it very loud so that she could hear me over the loud noise downstairs. When she suddenly has this epiphany, she said, oh, I know what it is. There's some axe-wielding, bud-thirsty, mouth-foaming, homicidal maniac who's running around our neighborhood cutting people up into little bits. Go check it out. And I remember, now this is the age of equality. I say to her, you go check it out. And she said, I can't. I haven't put on my makeup. And I said, well, neither have I. Uh, well, I lost rock, scissors, paper, so I went down. And sure enough, there's this man banging on our front door. I crack open the door, and here stands this giant he says to me, are you Carl Hafner? I said, well, that, that all depends. Uh, <laughs> like, who are you? He explained, well, I'm here to serve you with papers. You're getting sued for an accident that you were involved in a couple of years ago. And with that, he handed me a stack of papers as thick as the church hymnal, and he disappeared. Now, at that point, I had an option. I had a choice I had to make. I could take the stack of papers, dump it in the recycling bin in the kitchen, go back to Cherie and say, oh, it was nothing, just some drunk knocking on the wrong door. I could have done that. I didn't. Instead, I spent the holiday that year calling all of my attorney friends asking them, what should I do? They all told me the same thing. Whatever you do, don't ignore it. Because it's not going to just go away. Someday, you will have to stand accountable for that accident. And they were right. The day of judgment did, in fact, come. And this is the point that Paul is making here. We all, Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. We will all face the judgment of God. That's the bad news, because we will all stand guilty. The good news is that for those who choose Christ, we will stand perfect, righteous on that day of judgment. I love the way Alistair Berg puts it. He writes, what would we have to say before the bar of God's judgment? Only one thing, Christ died in my place. That's the only thing we can say at the bar of judgment. That's the gospel. Christ died in my place. Pastor Johnny V. Miller recalls how when he was a teenager, he was absolutely obsessed with the Holocaust. 
He was disturbed and appalled and grieved by it, but he couldn't get enough literature on it. He said one of the most disturbing things was when he saw pictures of both Auschwitz and Dachau. The big sign, the outside of the concentration camps. Now, I am German, but I don't speak German. I put it there in your outline. I'm sure for those of you who speak fluent German, and I know there are a few of you, uh, that I am butchering the pronunciation of this German phrase, what is on the outside of these concentration camps. Arbeit macht frei, or something like that. What it means, work makes free. Work makes free. Miller writes, it was a lie, a false hope. The Nazis made the people believe hard work would equal liberation. But the promised liberation was horrifying suffering and death. Work makes free. One reason that phrase haunts me is because it is the same spiritual lie of this age. It is a satanic lie. It is a religious lie. It is a false hope, an impossible dream for many people in the world. They believe their good works will be great enough to outweigh their bad works. That's the way a lot of people think about the judgment of God. Well, if in my life I can have more good works than bad works, then God will have to save me. He says a lot of people think that way, allowing them then to stand before God in eternity and say, you owe me the right to enter into your heaven. It is the hope of every false religion. Work makes free. No. No. It's only the love of God that liberates. It's the blood of Jesus Christ, writes Miller, that liberates. He died, and I am free, because he died in my place. The bad news, nobody escapes the judgment of God. The good news, Jesus assumes our guilt, and we are pardoned. All praise be to God for his wonderful judgment.
Thank you, young sisters. I'm telling you, you do not want to miss out tonight. There's going to be a lot of music just like that. It's going to be phenomenal. Let me leave us with a blessing. Father, I pray that you would anoint us now by your Holy Spirit to live a life of assurance and security in Christ. Go with us now as we seek to live the way of Jesus, to love like him in his name. Amen.